and I'm so glad that you're here today. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, my name is Matt Darby. I get to be the pastor here on our Gilmer campus, and uh, I, I really am excited uh, to have you today. And if you're a guest with us, I hope you feel right at home uh, and that uh, you, just, you just go, man, I don't know what it is about these people, but if nothing else, they look good and they are super nice, right? We're at least that. Uh, no, I hope you do feel right at home. And uh, that Today is a special day. We're going to end our time of worship by taking the Lord's Supper together. Um, if you want to know how we do that, we practice what is called open communion. Open meaning you don't have to be a member of this church. You just have to be a believer in Jesus. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we want you to do that with us. Uh, so it's a special day for that, but it's also a special day because today kicks off uh, seven days of prayer and fasting for us. You heard Pastor Ben talk about that a moment ago. Um, we're going to talk a lot about fasting today and prayer and because as we step into this week of Holy Week and as we begin to move toward Easter, there are some very specific things that we're asking God to do in our church, in, in us corporately, and in us as individual believers. Matter of fact, I've got some things, if you want to take a picture of this, this is some things that I'm going to ask you to pray through all week, especially if you are doing the fast with us. I want you to pray through these things with us. We are praying that God would give us his manifest presence and that he would fill the Civic Center and the Longview campus. We are just praying that on Sun, Easter Sunday, when we're over in the Civic Center, his manifest presence would just fill, right? And you're like, well, isn't God everywhere all the time, every time, in all times? Yes, that's his omnipresence. His manifest presence is that unique pouring out into a moment, into a heart, onto a church. We're asking for that for the manifest presence of God. I'm asking that he would give us 2,000 plus people to worship with us for Easter. Understand, Gilmer's got a city population of 5,500. I'm asking for 2,000 of them rascals to be in the Civic Center on Sunday. You know what I mean? It'd be amazing. Um, I'm praying for dozens and dozens of salvations. Easter is a unique time when people are open to coming back to church and I am praying that that day they would intersect the gospel and something would be so irresistible to them that their lives would be changed. And that would have nothing to do with a song we sang or a word. It would just be the power of God at work is what I'm praying for. I'm praying that hundreds and hundreds of people would experience a renewed desire for the presence of God. For those who are just kind of living out on the fringes of the Christian life, that something would happen in them this week and on that Sunday where there would this desire for more of God's presence would just wake up. And then I am asking that we would see through this week of prayer and fasting that we would see miracles of deliverance, breakthrough, and healing as we do this together. Some of you need deliverance. <laughs> you need to be delivered. You may feel like there's, there's, there's an evil oppression on you. you. You may have a stronghold of sin. You may need to see a breakthrough in your marriage or your finances. You may have a sickness in your body. I am praying that as we pray and fast this week, we would, we would begin to hear stories of deliverance and breakthrough and healing and just miracles. I'm praying by the time we gather on Wednesday night, which by the way, during the week of prayer and fasting, our midweek prayer gathering is going to be really important uh, because we're all going to be pretty hungry by then if you're doing this with us. Um, and to be able to encourage one another, lift each other up. And so um, I'm praying we would see these things. And we're setting this week aside to pray and to fast because we believe certain things are true about prayer. There are certain things I believe are true about prayer. I don't have time to teach these. I just want you to know that you're, you're sitting in a church that believes what we're about to say. Here's one of the things we believe is true about prayer, that there are things God will do in prayer that he will not do apart from prayer. I just believe that to be true. There are things God will do in our lives personally and in us as a church when we pray that he will not do if we do not pray. I just believe that. You go, well, where do you get that? Think about this moment in one of the Gospels where the disciples are trying to cast this demon out, right? And they can't. They can't do it. Jesus comes up, casts the demon out immediately, and the disciples go, Man, we were doing that. We were, we were invoking your name. We were doing what you taught us to do, but we couldn't do it. Why? And Jesus goes, because that only comes out through prayer and fasting. That mountain 
only moves in prayer. Listen, if you've got a mountain that needs to move, there are some things God is only going to do when you pray and he will not do apart from prayer. We just believe that. Here's the other thing. We believe that prayer is the primary means by which we pursue the presence of God. How do I get into the presence of God? I pray. That is the primary means by which we pursue the presence of God, and everything flows from the presence of God. Your power to have freedom over sin flows from the presence of God. Your power, your, the courage to share the gospel, faith to believe God's going to show up, strength to be faithful in your marriage, all of these things flow from the manifest presence of God with you. So prayer is the primary means by which we pursue the presence of God. We believe when we pray, God will do things that he won't do apart from prayer. Everything flows from the presence of God, which means this now. That makes prayer the first work of importance, the work of first importance for the church. Prayer is the work of first importance for the church. Meaning, church is about a lot of things, and it's about a lot of good things. Church is about life groups. Those are great. I love them. You need to be in one, by the way, if you're not. Church is about fellowship. It's about teaching. It's about singing. It's about missions. It's about a lot of things. The first work of the church is prayer. Well, Darby, where do you get that? Because Jesus never said, my house will be called a house of preaching or a house of fellowship or a house of singing or a house of mission trips. He did say, my house will be a house of prayer. When you get to the first and second Timothy, you've got Paul writing these letters to this young pastor named Timothy, who's pastoring the church in Ephesus. And Paul writes this, these letters to teach Timothy how to pastor a church. <laughs> He's teaching this young guy, okay, here's what you got to do. And in first Timothy chapter two, he begins to tell Timothy things like, Timothy, you're going to have to have elders in your church, godly men who are elders. You need to raise up deacons. You need to um, have member care. You need to take care of your members. You need to have solid teaching. You need to teach them how to give all of these things, right? He says, this is how you build a church. But here's how Paul starts that section in first uh, Timothy chapter two. He says this first, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all. That's four different words for one word, prayer. Supplication, prayer, thanksgiving, intercession. That's prayer. So Paul says, yes, Timothy, you need elders. You need deacons. You need good teaching. You need member care. You need uh, to teach them how to give. You need to do all of these things. But first things first, pray. Pray. Prayer is the work of first importance in the church. And as new beginnings has come to see that and walk in that, as we've come to, to see prayer as our work of first importance, fasting has taken on a new significance for us. When we started the prayer and we prioritized it three years and three months ago, we have fasted more in those three years and three months than we did in the 10 years that I was serving New Beginnings before. And I think the reason for that is because even when you look in Scripture, you see that prayer and fasting are often tied together. Now, you can look through the Bible, and you will see a lot of instances where people pray and they're not fasting. You would be hard-pressed to find moments where they're fasting and not praying. Fasting always involves prayer. It always draws us in to intensify our prayer life. Fasting is not new. Fasting's been around the church literally from the beginning of the church. This has been a rhythm in God's people since the church was born. As a matter of fact, you can go back to the Old Testament. God's people kept a rhythm of fasting twice a week. This has been going on for thousands of years. And listen, Jesus assumed, he assumed that his people would fast. He just assumed that his disciples would do this. He said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. When you fast, not if you fast, not if you get around to fasting. And he said it right in the flow of some other teachings. He said, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. That's all right there in Matthew chapter 6. So those, those pillars there of being a disciple of Jesus, prayer, giving, and fasting, Jesus put them all in together. He assumed that we would do this. But let's acknowledge some things here. Biblical fasting is not a regular rhythm for most believers. Right? 
Oh, you may do some intermittent fasting because somebody on the internet told you if you skip breakfast, you'll drop 80,000 pounds and look super svelte, right? Uh, But biblical fasting is not a regular rhythm for most believers today. Why is that? I think there's a couple reasons. One, we're just not much for self-denial, are we? We're just not. We live in a culture that emphasizes self-gratification and immediate gratification. And we, and I'm including this dude, we build lives of comfort and ease and satisfaction. And we tend to push away from anything that's uncomfortable. And fasting is uncomfortable. It is. right? It creates this felt absence and longing in our bodies for something that we want or something that we need, but we're choosing to do without, and we're just not good at doing without. That's one reason, right? Culturally, we just don't, we just don't want to deny the self. There's another reason, though, I think that is true, and that is fasting isn't a regular rhythm for us because we still lack a full understanding of what it is why we should do it, and the power of God associated with it. I think if we had a full understanding of fasting, I I would never have to teach on it again because it would be like, I will never go without fasting because God shows up when I fast. God meets me when I fast. He does miracles when I fast. Um, But we don't have a full understanding. And listen, we tend to push away from things we don't understand. My wife was a math teacher for years. Some of you have taught math or do teach math. You know what I don't do? I don't talk to math teachers about why a negative times a negative is a positive. I refuse to talk. You want to know why? Because I believe it's witchcraft. It's not true. Uh, If you tell me, Darby, you you have a bunch of negative in your life. Yeah, I see that. Now we're going to multiply that negative even more. We're going to compound more negative. You know what happens if I start with negative and just put more negative in? Things get worse, not better. But somehow in the voodoo of math, we go, no, just more, let's multiply our negative and <laughs> Harry Potter style, it's a positive. No, that's a lie. I don't believe it. I refuse to accept that that's true, right? So I don't talk about it because it makes me furious. I don't understand it. Um, I really don't. Anyway, so we push away from that, right? And fasting is like that. It's one of those things where we don't fully understand it. We know it doesn't feel good. We're not confident of how God shows up in it. And so it's just become, and we've kind of lost the essence of this for us. So I have two goals today. The first goal is this, that every single person, every believer in this room would walk out those doors today and think to yourself, that's important and I need to do it. That's a goal. That, and you're saying, but I've never done it. Okay, there's a lot of different ways to fast. The fast we're doing this week, if you scan the QR code, you're going to find out there's different ways you can do this. This isn't just going without anything for the next seven days, right? There's, you can skip one meal a day. You can go sun up to sundown. You can do vegetables and fruit. You, you just, there's several different things that you can do. But the point is, I want every believer in this room, when you walk out those doors, to have ringing in your heart fasting matters. There's a reason Jesus assumed I'm going to do it, and I need to do it because God shows up. I want that. That's a goal for everybody. The other goal is that for those of you who are already doing this fast with us, you will be excited about your week. You would actually look at it not with dread. You would look at it going, oh man, God is about to show up in my life, and I'm excited about that. All right. So let me give you a definition of fasting, then we're going to jump into the God's Word. What is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from something that we need or enjoy for the purpose of intense spiritual focus through Scripture and prayer. There's, a lot, there's different definitions of fasting. This is ours for today. Fasting is abstaining from something that we need or enjoy for the purpose of intense spiritual focus through Scripture and prayer. And when it talks about abstaining from something we need or enjoy, usually it's talking about food. It's talking about food. I know a lot of times we say, well, I I think I'll fast from social media, when in reality, the social media is a sin issue because it consumes so much of our life that setting it aside is really just trying to set sin aside. Fasting is doing without something we want or need, right? 
Fasting is mentioned 70, about 77 times in the Bible. 76 of those are in reference to doing without food. There's one of them that's not. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul talks about how it, it could be possible that within a marriage covenant, a husband and wife may abstain from sexual intimacy for a season in order to pursue more of the presence of God in their marriage. Other than that one instance, the rest of them are in a reference to abstaining from food. By the way, the Bible mentions baptism about 75 times. So as much as God talks about baptism, he talks about fasting. That's, that's pretty important, right? So we're talking about abstaining in some way, for the most part, from food, right? No, understand, I realize there are medical situations where you've got to have something, so be wise, but this is what it's talking about. In other words, you're, you're not going to fast from your cholesterol medicine, okay? Take it, please. Just don't. And for some of you, like, hey, you know, Darby, I get up every day and I have biscuits and gravy, but this week, only biscuits. That's not a fast, man. You know what I mean? I'm going to fast from seconds. No, please don't do that. We're going to fast, right? We're going to give something up. We're going to feel it. This is, uh, this is intentionally abstaining from something natural so that I can take hold of the supernatural. That's what this is. It's not just saying no to food. It's, it's going without food for a Godward purpose, for a kingdom purpose. All right? So I want to look at a place in the Bible where Jesus teaches us about fasting. Matthew chapter 9. Why don't you grab your Bible, head that way. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. Here's what's happening. The disciples of John the Baptist are coming to Jesus to ask him about fasting. Now, Jesus is getting peppered, by the way, in Matthew chapter 9 with all sorts of questions from the scribes and Pharisees, and they're trying to catch him, and they're like, oh, why did you forgive that guy's sin? Only God can do that. And Jesus goes, yeah, you're right. And then he heals him and says, now you know I'm God. And then a little bit later, he calls Matthew out of his tax booth and says, I want you to come follow me, and he goes to his house and the Pharisees are right there to go, why does your teacher eat with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus, knowing the question in their heart, looks at them and says, because I came for sick people. I came for people who need healing. I want you to hear me this morning. I don't care what your sin issue is. Jesus came for you. He came to heal you and to set you free. And you are exactly who he had in mind when he came into this world and died on the cross. You get, to, you get to verse 14 of Matthew chapter 9, and the disciples of John the Baptist are coming to ask Jesus a question, but it's not like the Pharisees and the scribes. These are guys who walk with John the Baptist, and Jesus loved John the Baptist, deeply respected him and loved him. Matter of fact, John the Baptist was his cousin. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. Jesus would say in Matthew 11, verse 11, that of men born of woman... There's no one greater than John the Baptist. That's amazing. He loved this man. And so these, this question that his disciples are about to ask are really, they're, they're just trying to discover. Many of these men were probably standing with John in Matthew 4 when he pointed up at Jesus and went, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right. So they know they're coming to the Savior. And here's what they ask. Verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Right? So, Jesus, help us understand. And Jesus answers their question with three illustrations. He talks about a wedding. He talks about new and old cloth. And he talks about wine and wine skins. He says this in verse 15. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guest mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Right? Jesus goes, do you go to a wedding to mourn and to grieve? Do you go to a wedding to do without? No, you go to a wedding to celebrate. You go to a wedding to feast. Right? He goes, I'm with them. It's like they're at a wedding right now. Verse 16, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made, and neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. 
but new wine is put into fresh wineskins. And so both are preserved. So here's what you need to know about this old cloth, old wineskins conversation. Jesus is talking about the old system, the old covenant, the old way of doing things. And he's looking at the disciples of John the Baptist and he's telling them, I've come to do something new. I've come to do a new thing. I'm doing a new thing, and the thing that I'm doing, you won't be able to take the new thing that I'm doing and force it into the old system. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of heaven, the ways of the kingdom, and he is telling them the ways of the kingdom of heaven are not going to fit into the old religious practices. And so he looks at these men and he says, right now they have me with them. My disciples have me with them. And while I'm with them, they're going to feast because the day is going to come when I won't be with them and they'll long that day for what they have this day, which is my presence, and they will fast. Brings us to the first point. Here it is. We fast to create a greater longing for the presence of God. We fast to create a greater longing for the presence of God. That's the point Jesus is making, right? The day is going to come When I'm no longer with my disciples, Jesus knew the cross was in his future. He knew his death, burial, and resurrection was coming. He knew the day would come when these men would long to have Jesus with him, with him, but he would be gone. Right? And Jesus goes, then they are going to fast because they're going to long for my presence. Listen, fasting, we fast to create a a longing for the presence of God of God. It's our way of saying, God, I'm, I'm willing to feel this sense of hunger. I'm willing to feel this sense of, of absence and this, this, this sense of need and desire to remind me of my greater need for you and the greater fullness that I get in your presence. We fast to create that longing for God. Would anybody else just acknowledge with me that today you need the Holy Spirit to give you a greater longing for the presence of God. How many of you would just acknowledge, I need that today. I need the Holy Spirit to work something in me that is not there right now. I need a greater longing for the presence of God. Something important to see is while fasting is given to create that longing for the presence of God, We're not trying to earn something from God, and we're not trying to win the approval of man when we do this. Another place where Jesus taught about fasting is Matthew chapter 6. And in verse 17, he says this, But when you fast, again, there's there's that declarative statement that he just assumes his disciples will do this. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father, who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What's the point Jesus is making? We don't fast to impress people. We fast to experience God. We fast to encounter God. And there's this false idea that if you're fasting, no one can know. And if somebody finds out you're fasting, it ruins your fast, and you might as well go to the drive-thru and eat a bag full of cheeseburgers because the blessing is over, right? Somebody found out. No, it's over. It's not the point Jesus is making. The point he's making is when you fast, don't make a show of it. And don't try to win the fleeting, useless approval of men. Fast to encounter God. Fast to get the reward of God. Which means this is not about what I'm doing without. This is about what I'm making room for, which is more of God. So that's the first big idea. We do this to encounter God or to to create a longing for the presence of God. Why do you need to do this personally? Why do I need to do this? Why do we as a church need to do this? It's the second idea. When we fast, we open ourselves up to deep spiritual cleansing. When we fast, we open ourselves up to deep spiritual cleansing. Growing up, I grew up out in the woods on a cattle farm, and I would be gone all day, and I would come home, And when I would come home, there would be a fragrance. There was a fragrance, and it wasn't a good one. Uh, And there could be any number of things on my body from having been out in the woods and out in the field all day. Ticks, fleas, 
leaves, sticks, cow manure, who knows? It could have all been on me. And when I came home after a full day, you know what I needed? A deep cleansing, a deep one. I'm talking about one of those where my mother didn't trust me to handle it on my own. She had to scrub the new skin. Um, Fasting opens us up to a deep spiritual cleansing because there are impurities that get on us and get in us that we need the help of the Holy Spirit to rid from us. We need deep spiritual cleansing, listen, because we live in two worlds. We live in a physical world and we live in a spiritual world and those worlds are at odds with one another. They're at odds with one another. Our flesh wants to be in control, but the Spirit of God needs to be in control and should be in control. And the Holy Spirit that lives in us wants to live for God. But listen, for most of our lives, we have trained ourselves to obey the flesh, which Romans 8 says is actually hostile toward God. Am I right? For most of our lives, we've just trained ourselves to obey the flesh. Which Romans 8, 13 says is, or Romans 8 says is hostile toward God. The flesh wants to please itself. The spirit wants to please God. And the war is on. And Paul says this in Romans 8, 13. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Here's what's super important in that verse. One, Paul says, there is an end to those who only live in the flesh. And it isn't just a physical death, it's a spiritual death. This is for those who do not know Jesus and have no imparting of his righteousness in them. But for believers, understand, he says, but if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body. You want to know why that's important? Because your flesh and your body is powerless to defeat the sins of your flesh and your body. You cannot do it. How many of you would acknowledge, I've got sin issues and I've thrown my best effort at them, my best effort at them to no avail. To no avail. Right? Why? Because your flesh cannot defeat itself. Your willpower is not enough. Paul says, it is by the Holy Spirit of God that you put to death the deeds of the body. Well, how in the world then do I get more of the Spirit? How do I invite the Holy Spirit to get on top of and reverse this horrible dynamic of me perpetually, gladly just yielding to the flesh, powerlessly just giving up? How do I reverse this? I pray and fast. I invite the Lord God to give his manifest presence more of his spirit and to undo the power of my flesh. We need a deep spiritual cleansing. All right. Another word for this spiritual cleansing is consecration. Consecration, that's a super churchy word. Um, if you registered for the fast, by the way, you got an email Uh, with a consecration guide that Pastor Todd wrote. It is really good. Every one of us need this. But in there, he talks about consecration, and here's what he said. Consecration is to cleanse someone or something from sin or impurity and then setting the person or the thing apart to the Lord for his purposes. So it's cleansing someone or something from sin or impurity and then setting it apart for the Lord, for the Lord's purposes. Purposes. If you go back to the Old Testament and the worship in the temple or the tabernacle, here's what you're going to find. Every single thing that was used in the worship of God had to be consecrated. From the priest himself to the bowls that he carried, everything had to be consecrated, which means it had to be made clean in order to be made ready for God. It had to be made pure. It had to be cleansed. The man And the stuff had to be made clean in order to be made ready. Listen, believer, the same is true for us. If what we want is to be ready for more of God, then we got to be made clean to be made ready. And the reason we don't have more of God is we because we have sin, we have impurity, we have secret sin, we have things that we toy with and keep and pet and enjoy, and we're not willing to give those up in order to have more of God. I want you to hear me say this. God does not come where he is not desired. 
He doesn't come where he is not desired. What we want, you know what I want? I want God to just drop kick the front door of my house open and force his way in. You know what he doesn't do? That. God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on anybody. He doesn't come if he's not desired. You want to know the picture that Jesus painted for us to give us an understanding of how God approaches us and how he approaches us? He said this in Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. I knock. And if you will hear my voice and come and open the door, I'll come in and I'll eat with you. And I'll be with you. The point is not that you eat something physically with God. The point is that you feast on his presence. Fasting opens us up to a deep spiritual cleansing. This is why David said in Psalm 24, who gets to ascend the hill of the Lord? Right? Who gets to go up? Who gets to stand in his holy place? The answer comes back, he who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. That man, that person is going to receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The person who is made clean gets to draw near to God. The person who is made clean and therefore is made ready from the inside out, that person is going to experience the blessing of the presence of God. We have to be made clean in order to be made ready. And listen, being made clean does not mean we just try to manage a few outside behaviors. Because here's what you know to be true. Here's what I know to be true. I can manage this exterior pretty well to look as if nothing internally needs to change, right? I can manage this outside pretty well. The truth is the real sin issues in our life are under the surface and not on it. It is very easy for me to hide bitterness. That is so easy. It is so easy for me to hide unforgiveness towards someone. It is so easy for me to hide the fact that I'm really a greedy person and I don't obey when it comes to being generous and giving. I don't do that. It's easy to hide that. It's easy to hide lust. It's easy to hide jealousy. It's easy to hide that I covet what my neighbor and my friends and my coworkers have because I don't have. It's easy to hide that. So how do I get into those places where that stuff is under the surface and it's down deep and it's grown tentacles and it's wrapped itself around my joy and my contentment and my comfort and my peace? How do I get down into that? You need a deep spiritual cleansing. This isn't about just managing the outside. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said this, clean hands will not suffice unless they are connected with a pure heart. True religion is heart work. We may wash the outside of the cup and the platter as long as we please, but if the inward parts be filthy, we are filthy altogether in the sight of God. Listen to this. For our hearts are more truly ourselves than our hands are. What does it mean? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Our heart is more truly ourselves than our hands are. The very life of our being lies in the inner nature. And hence the imperative need of purity within. The pure in heart shall see God. All others are but blind bats. He could have left that last part off, but he did it anyway. But he's not wrong, right? We need a deep spiritual cleansing. Listen, every person in this room, there is sin in our life that grieves the Spirit of God. There are things that we allow to linger and things that we toy with that grieve the heart of God. And where God is grieved, His presence does not remain. And if what we need is more of the manifest presence of God, then we pray our way back to Him through prayer, through fasting, and through allowing Him to consecrate us again. 
and you may dive into this for the next seven days, and you're going to come to a place spiritually where you've never been, but do you know what you're going to have to make a regular rhythm in your life? Every day waking up and dealing with the sin that has separated you from the manifest presence of God. And every day, I got to wake up, and once again, I got to make myself clean in order to be made ready. Every day. Right? So we have this deep spiritual cleansing. Here's the last thing I want you to know. When we fast, we feast with God. Uh, this changes how I see fasting. Right? When we fast, we're actually feasting with God. Again, Jesus assumed that his disciples were going to fast, not because it was just what religious people did. He assumed we would fast because of the spiritual breakthrough that fasting brings, because of the personal intimacy with God that flows out of our fasting. We mentioned that verse in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus talks about, you know, wash your face, anoint your head, don't look all sad and droopy. And he says, and your father who sees in secret, look at what he says in Matthew 18b, and your father who sees this fasting will reward you. G Listen to that. That's the Savior of the world, the Jesus who died, whose body and blood we're going to remember in just a moment, who crawled upon the cross, defeated death, and was resurrected, and will come back as the returning king. That Jesus guarantees results when you fast and pray. He guarantees it. The Father who sees your earnestness to fast and to pray, the Father who sees that you're willing to deal with your sin, he will reward you. And what is the reward of God? More of God. More of his power, more of his overcoming, more of his victory, more of his freedom, more of his courage, more of his comfort, more of his presence. When we fast, we feast with God. Fasting is where we gorge ourselves on the bread of life. It's where we drink our fill of the living water. So I want to ask you a few questions, and then we're going to jump into prayer, and, then we're, and we'll take the Lord's Supper. It, what are you desperate for God to do in your life? What are you desperate for God to do? Where do you need, where do you need breakthrough? Where do you need spiritual breakthrough? I think some of you want to see your marriage be all that God intends it to be, but you know it is not. Have you fasted and prayed? And prayed and fasted? Some of you have a child that has wandered away from the Lord, and you just see that their eyes are closed to the gospel, and you would give anything for that to change. Have you prayed and fasted? There's things God will do when we pray, right? Some of you this morning, you, you earnestly need direction from God. You do not know what he wants you to do. You've got decisions in front of you. You're not sure what the next step to take is. Have you prayed and fasted? Some of you have been bound up by the same addiction for so many years. You don't remember not having this sin issue in your life. You have no victory. As a matter of fact, it's just so present all the time. You've just to come, you've come to assume it's a part of who you are. Have you prayed and fasted? Some of you may have just be full of bitterness and unforgiveness because of something that was done to you. You just can't find healing. Have you prayed and fasted? Here's my challenge to you. That you would see fasting as important and powerful as something you must do. And that God will meet you. Jesus guaranteed that if you will fast and pray, God will meet you. God will reward you. So I'm asking you in just a minute before you go, that QR code is going to go up one more time. The fast starts today. It'll go up one more time. Scan it. Be a part of this with us. And determine that for these next seven days, 
You're going to put these areas in your life that you need the presence of God. You're going to put them before the Lord. And we're going to let God reward. All right. We're going to get ready to take the Lord's Supper together. Before we do that, God's Word is very clear that we have to prepare our heart for that moment. That the Lord's Supper is a holy thing. It is a, a holy remembering of the sacrifice of Jesus. And Paul makes clear that we have to prepare our heart. Well, how do we do that? We prepare our heart first by making sure Jesus is our Lord. Before you receive this communion is for those who have received the blood of Jesus and been born again. So Paul says you should examine yourself to make sure you are in the faith. So for every person in this room this morning, understand this this bread and this juice that we're about to drink and eat, it's a symbol, it's a picture of the body and the blood of Christ that was broken for us and shed for us on the cross. Why was that necessary? Because we were created for a relationship with God. You were created to live your life, not just in heaven with God, but right now, you're created for a relationship with God. It's how He made you, it's why He made you, and it's why there's no other relationship you can pursue in this world that'll give you what God created for you to only get from Him. It's why you bounce from one to the next. It's why the job's never enough, the money's never enough, the marriage ain't enough, the stuff, the the cars ain't enough, my kids can't succeed enough. None of it will ever be enough because you're created for relationship with God. The problem is we have sin, and sin separates us. God is holy, we are sinful. And we, sin cannot dwell where holiness is. So between our sin and God's holiness, Something that we could not do had to happen. And Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin over here so that through the cross and through the body and the blood of Jesus, we might have relationship with the Holy God over here. So my question to you is, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Can you look at a moment and go, I met Jesus, everything changed. I'm not perfect, but holy cow, I'm forgiven and I'm not the same. In just a minute, we're going to bow and pray. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can receive your first communion today, having made Jesus the Lord of your life. The prayer is very simple Lord Jesus, I believe what He said, I believe what Your Word says, what You said died for my sin and I receive your blood, your blood, your body broken for me and would you give me relationship with the holy God, I was made for him and I want that so that's it so we have to prepare our heart that way everybody in the room should do that, every heart in this room should affirm their salvation here's the next thing we also prepare our heart by confessing every sin every sin laying down every burden and praying through every doubt. Sin, burden, and doubt. (laughs) Because we can confess our sin, but sometimes we have burdens that we're not willing to put down. We have doubt. We're doubting God's going to come through. We're doubting He's actually good. We're doubting His plan for our life. So what the next few minutes are going to be about, the altar's going to be open. Some of you need to come to the altar. Some of you just need to maybe even get on your knees in your chair. Some of you just need to head down, spend some time in prayer. The next few minutes are about confessing every sin. Laying down every burden at the feet of Jesus and leaving it there. And praying through every doubt. Let the Holy Spirit do the cleansing so that you can come to this table in the right way. Lord, I just pray for the next few minutes. Your Holy Spirit would show us everything we need to know about ourselves. I pray for those in the room who do not know Jesus as Lord. God, right now, would you stir in them? Holy Spirit, speak to them. Help them pray and make you the Lord of their life. In Jesus' name.